Hey guys, Jake here, coming at you with another math lesson today. Today we're going to continue our discussion of rational functions. Specifically, we're going to be talking about what to do in those cases when you have common factors between the numerator and the denominator of your rational function. Be sure to check out my new precalculus study guide at jakesmathlessons.com slash precalculus dash study dash guide or scan that QR code in the upper right hand corner of your screen right up here. Well, anyway, let's go ahead and jump into the content here. So I've been talking a lot recently about rational functions. Just a quick reminder, a rational function is just a function that is a fraction where both the top and the bottom of that fraction are just a polynomial. So we can see an example right here. If we have this sort of a problem where we want to sketch the graph of this function f of x equals x squared plus 3x all over x squared plus x minus 6, both x squared plus 3x and x squared plus x minus 6 are examples of polynomials. So since this entire function is just one polynomial all over another polynomial, we do have a rational function here. So what do I mean, first of all, when I say that this rational function has common factors? Well, let's think about that. So in general, this rational function, which is a polynomial over a polynomial, Typically when you're doing these problems talking about, you know, graphing a rational function, you're, you're going to start looking for things like vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, uh, maybe X and Y intercepts, maybe uh, N behavior, uh, maybe slant asymptotes, maybe holes. There's a handful of different things you want to start to test for if you're trying to sketch a graph of a function. Specifically in this video, I'm going to be talking about what differs when you have common factors between the numerator and the denominator. And the reason why common factors are important, in my last video I talked about horizontal and vertical asymptotes. And the first step in figuring those things out is to factor the numerator and the denominator of your rational function. So let's start there. Let's think about how we can factor out both the top and bottom of this function. So if we have x squared plus 3x all over x squared plus x minus 6, we want to factor out the numerator and denominator. So looking at our numerator first, the top of our fraction, x squared plus 3x, let's think about how to factor that out. So first off, if you only have two terms, well, in general, if you're factoring, the first place you usually want to start is to look for a greatest common factor or something that each term within that polynomial is divisible by. When you only have two terms, that's even more so going to be the case. Um, so looking at this numerator here, you can see that both x squared and 3x, both of those terms have an x in them. So we can actually factor out the x. So pull the x out of that. If we pull x out of x squared, that would just leave us with an x inside the parentheses. And then if we pull x out of 3x, we are just left with plus 3. So that's how we would factor out our numerator. Okay. Now what about our denominator? In this case, you know, looking for a greatest common factor is not really going to help us because there's nothing that all three of these terms are divisible by that we can just divide out like we did up on the numerator. So we probably want to use the diamond method of thinking about uh, two numbers that multiply to negative 6 and add to positive 1 because we have a coefficient of positive 1 uh, on our x term. So two numbers that multiply to negative 6 add to positive 1 would be positive 3 and negative 2. So that would mean that this factors out into x uh, plus 3 times x minus 2. So this is where the common factors kind of reveal themselves. Once you factor out the numerator and denominator of your fraction, you want to look and see if they have any factors in common. And we can see here we have x plus 3 appearing both on the top and the bottom of this fraction. So if you were to think about what this function simplifies down to, those two factors would actually cancel out with each other, right? So we would be able to say that x plus 3 on the numerator and x plus 3 on the denominator actually cancel out. So what does that mean for our function? Well, if these two factors cancel out, then basically this function is equivalent to whatever's left over. So x over x minus 2. However, you want to be very, very careful here because this function right here, x over x minus 2, is going to be equivalent to our original function 
except at the x value that makes this canceled out factor be zero. So we wanna make sure that we're excluding the place where x plus three equals zero, which if we minus three from both sides would give us x equals negative three. So as long as x does not equal negative three, this function right here is gonna be equivalent to this function right here, okay? The reason why they are not equivalent at x equals negative three is think about what would happen if you plug x equals negative three into each of these two versions of this function. If you plug it in here, you would just get negative three over negative three minus two, which would be negative three over negative five or three fifths, right? So we actually get a three fifths there. If you plug negative three into this original function, you're gonna end up getting zero on the denominator. So we would get some number divided by zero. You can't divide by zero, right? If you're ever dividing by zero at any point in a problem, you needed a, that should be sounding all sorts of alarm bells in your head. You can't divide by zero at all. It breaks the rules of math. So if you plug in this one spot that makes that common factor equal zero into the simplified function and the original function, you don't get the same thing. However, if you plug in any other x value, you will get the same thing. So basically what that tells us is that this original function f of x that we had here is equivalent is equivalent to x over x minus two, as long as x does not equal negative three. So when x does not equal negative three. Okay, so this is kind of the simplified down version of our function. But like I said, the x equals negative three is kind of a, a, an issue, right? We can't plug x equals negative three into the original function. But how does that actually kind of show up in the graph of a function? Because remember, that's kind of our goal here. We're trying to figure out what the graph of this function looks like. Well, basically what that tells us is if we instead graph this function right here, x over x minus two, and then just remove the point at x equals negative three and put a hole right there instead, that's what this original function will look like. So we can start thinking about, okay, what sort of horizontal asymptotes and vertical asymptotes does this function have? So if we now consider f of x equals x over x minus two, I'm not gonna go too in depth here um, because I did just make a video about how to do this and I'll come put an info card up at the top of your screen there if you wanna go check that out. But this is gonna have a vertical asymptote at uh, x equals positive two and it's gonna have a horizontal asymptote. Since the degree of the numerator and denominator is the same, we would just take the coefficients of the numerator and denominator x term, which is one over one. So we get y equals one, a horizontal asymptote. Okay, we could also quickly figure out some other things like uh, the y-intercept would occur where x equals zero. So we could plug in x equals zero into this function. We would get zero over negative two, which is zero. So our y-intercept is at um, y equals z uh, zero. Our x-intercept would occur where the output of this function equals zero. So if we set it equal to zero, which in general, a rational function is gonna equal zero whenever the numerator equals zero. So this is just gonna be zero equals x. Okay, well, that's not really new information. Our y-intercept and x-intercept are both zero. So that just tells us that this function goes through the point zero, zero. Okay, so basically we go through the origin, zero, zero. We don't intersect the x or y axis anywhere else. We have a horizontal asymptote at y equals one and a vertical asymptote at x equals two. So, you know, we could just draw a little sketch of this. So we go through the origin. We have a vertical asymptote at x equals two. So at x equals two, we're gonna have a vertical asymptote. Uh, a horizontal asymptote at y equals one. So at y equals one, we have a horizontal asymptote. Okay. 
Uh, and since we know we go through this point, we could also just kind of quickly plug in some other x values and just get some idea of where this function goes. So we could plug in like x equals one into this and we would get one over negative one. So that'd be an output of negative one when x equals one. We could plug in uh, x equals three and we would get three over three minus two is one. So three over one is three. So we would be up here. We could plug in four, we would get four over two, which is two. So we can start to see, you know, if we have these points up here with a vertical asymptote and horizontal asymptote, we probably get something that looks like this. That kind of curves down in here to those points as a horizontal asymptote and a vertical asymptote that it will never touch. And then similar kind of shape over here horizontal asymptote or these vertical asymptote here that we'll never touch. So we'll continue to get infinitely close to these vertical and horizontal asymptotes in each direction, uh, go through these points that we calculated, and now we have a pretty good sketch of our function, okay? However, again, we need to go back to this point right here, this big kind of red alarm point, because we can't divide by zero, okay? Remember, f of x equals x over x minus two is not the original function we were trying to graph. The original function we're trying to graph is this one up here, okay? Which is equivalent to this function that we just graphed right here at all points except x equals negative three. Well, like I kind of pointed out before, the way that manifests in the actual function is we essentially will just go to x equals negative three. So x equals negative three would be right about here. And we would just simply remove that point at x equals negative three from this function. So we can just erase that one little point. And then what we want to do is just kind of draw in a hole, basically. So graphically, how you represent a hole in a function is to just put a small hollow circle there. So now this function shows that we have a hole right here. So do be careful when you're drawing a hole, make sure that little circle is hollow. If it's solid like this, it represents an actual point on the function. So make sure that it is a hollow circle. So you can see that we do have this function here that looks exactly like x over x minus two, except we've removed this one point and left a hole when x equals negative three. And like I said, since when we plug x equals negative three into our original function, we don't get any output because we can't divide by zero. That tells us that at x equals negative three, we just straight up don't have any output. There's no point there. There's no, uh, you know, no, no point vertically above that, that spot on our graph. You know, sometimes what you might see in like a piecewise function or some sort of other problem, you might see a situation where you have like a hole in a function and then that point is shown above or below it somewhere. But that's not what we have in this case, because if you plug x equals negative three into this original function, you don't even get any sort of output. So we can't even say that it has a point somewhere else. It's just missing that point, which means x equals negative three is just not a part of the domain of this function. Well, if you did get some value out of that, this video, do me a favor, hit that like button down below. It's a huge help to my channel. Hit that subscribe button and that bell icon too, so you're notified of my new videos. And if you wanna keep this brain train rolling, just go click on that video up over there and uh, we'll keep talking about rational functions a bit more so you can really nail those down and ace the test. Thanks and see you next time.